Hi, and welcome to the next episode of Humans of AI interview series, where together with my guests from academia and business, we try to demystify what AI is and what it's not, hopefully making this whole concept a bit more approachable and digestible. Today, uh, we are welcoming Kate Devlin. Kate is a senior lecturer in social and cultural artificial intelligence in the Department or of Digital Humanities at King's College London. She's a former archeologist uh, with a PhD in computer science. Her research investigates how people interact with each other and react to technologies, both past and future. She's particularly interested in relationships with machines. Um, her book, Turned On, Science, uh, Sex and Robots, was published in October 2018 to widespread uh, critical acclaim. She tweets as uh, Dr. Kate Devlin. So without further ado, hi, Kate. <laughs> hi. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for agreeing to, to interview. No problem. Um, so I will, I must say, I'm very excited to have this interview with you. I've heard a lot about you and your work. So let's start about uh, talking about the juicy bit. <laughs> so your work around sex machines, obviously, and your book, uh, Turn On a Science, uh, Sex and Robots, uh, which tries to, like, you try to demystify the idea of the seductive uh, sex robot, which, which you always, you know, see this in, in uh, science, science fiction movies and uh, Hollywood movies. And, and you're trying to tackle it from the angle of like history and uh, myths and uh, legends. Uh, why, why did you decide to go did that route? And what, make you, what made you uh, to even start uh, writing this book? I think I'm, I'm very interested in people <laughs> and um, I was initially um, in my career I was an archaeologist mm -hmm. and then I moved into computer science so that I could specialize in archaeology and computer science and then I kept moving more and more towards computer science <laughs> but I found that I was really intrigued by the way people interact with technology mm -hmm. and so one of the things I really enjoyed finding out about was what happens when people um, have new technologies coming into society and how do they react to them and with sex robots I think it was because it's such a science fiction thing yeah. and I was seeing all these headlines in newspapers that were really sensational you know like sex robots are coming they're going to take yeah. over uh, women won't be needed anymore and I was just thinking I don't believe that I just don't believe it it doesn't correspond with what I'm seeing in the AI community or the um, interaction design community and so I decided um, with some friends, um, we were all in, the, in a bar <laughs> talking about this uh, and we said, you know, we should, we should do more work on this. And from there, I think it just, it became something that every time I found out a bit more information, I wanted to look more into it. So I was following these strange paths and one of the really interesting ones was just how far back this goes this idea of creating the perfect companion mm -hmm. and it's such I mean it's been around for thousands of years this mm -hmm. idea that we can build our perfect partner yeah. amazing so um, majority of your work um, focuses on social and cultural uh, studies and the way as you said people interact with each other and right now as technology progresses with robots uh, and that includes sexual relationships uh, the blurb from your book states, sexual activity is central to our very existence. It shapes how we think, how we act, and how we live. With advances in technology come machines uh, that may one day think independently. <laughs> so what do you think will happen to our relationships, right? Like when, when this happens or if this happens, how, do, how will people... Um, relate to each other and how, what will change? I don't think that all that much will change and I think that's partly because we are so human and you know we have this instinct to procreate it's it's biologically an urge some people act on that some people don't want to mm -hmm. um, some people will take it to its natural and I mean that in the sense of nature fulfillment to procreate others 
you know, just wants to have the pleasure. Um, everybody wants to have pleasure. And so I think that that's never going to go away. I think that's something hardwired into us, this need to connect to other humans and to feel desire for other humans and to create a form of intimacy. So I'm not worried in the long run that it's going to end up in a, in a weird world where people are being replaced by machines. I think that there's a, a new social category where we may find that we form bonds, we form social interactions with machines, whether those are robots or whether it's with a disembodied AI, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there is scope for emerging relationships that don't look like human-human relationships, but I don't think we're ever going to actually replace human-human relationships. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, so as, as you said, the, the, there is an area, um, for example, in Hollywood, right? Like you have so many movies which try to envision what's, what's okay. going to <laughs> so they try to more or less lousy um to 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 create those concepts of of the ai presence the omni <laughs> uh, presence in our everyday lives i've i'm sure you've seen the movie called her yep yeah, obviously or like <laughs> ex machina um which show humans who are like falling in love with technology uh in a romantic way um, do you think, like you, you mentioned that uh, the procreational bit will not go away, but do you think it may be also a, a threat to like alienate some people because, you know, it may be easier to bond relationship with a robot because you can program it that way? Yeah, there's definitely a lot of people worried about that. And, you know, I can see where the concerns come from there. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a companion that talks to you the way you want to be talked to, that will always agree with you. Um, that's a very compelling thing, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, will it be detrimental? I don't know. This is a big unknown. Um, there are people out there who form bonds with all sorts of things, um, you know. Other, right. So, I mean, the, there's a very, very simple one. If you think one step removed from humans, the bond people have with their pets, right? So they have, they form a friendship with, with pets. The pets don't necessarily know what you're talking to them about. They can react to your tone of voice um, mm. and they can respond with affection. You know, maybe it's another step on from that. And this feeling that you're being understood by something, the, the thing itself doesn't need to be intelligent if you can get that bond, if you can get that feeling returned to you in some way. You can, I wouldn't say delusion because most of the people know that this is not a real thing. It's not a delusional thing to think that an AI or a chatbot is talking to you. People are willing to accept that and suspend their disbelief. Um, and so I think it can be compelling and maybe for some people that's a really good thing. So perhaps it's through loneliness or perhaps it's because it's so much easier for us to often tell our secrets to people online that we don't have to sit in the same room as face to face so perhaps there's that aspect too that we feel we can confide without judgment in mm -hmm. something and so i think it has very powerful applications for that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah like you said it can be like a safe space for sharing yeah. emotions and and it can be also like a healing space right um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and we know that people very, very quickly um, will imbue the technology with those kind of attributes that we see in other humans. So we know that people identify and build up a rapport with robots, for example. Uh, and, and they are not doing this through some kind of delusion. They're not being fooled that these are real or that they're conscious. They're prepared to enter into this social engagement where they know what to expect and they set them limitations very quickly. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, so you also argued that the, as technology de develops, uh, more women uh, need to be involved to their, the, the, <laughs> sorry, diversify um, a sex robotics field, uh, which is dominated, as you rightly notice, um, by men um, when they create products for heterosexual and uh, men. Uh, so you point out that the AI technology can be used as a therapy, as we uh, said, for example, to treat anxiety uh, and the possible application towards understanding the psychology of uh, sex offenders, for example. Could you expand on that? Yes, there's a lot. There's a lot of different potential um, applications, I suppose. The, the one about treating sex offenders is really controversial and not necessarily something that could ever 
um, be ethically tested. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been some studies from the University of Montreal where they used virtual reality to see whether or not sex offenders would reoffend by placing them into a virtual environment and measuring arousal. So those kind of situations as a, as a rehabilitation step could be possible. But then there's a very dark aspects to that sort of do, should people be allowed to create um, robots, for example, sex robots that were in the form of a child, a childlike one? And we know that there's already a lot of problems with um, people who are buying childlike sex dolls. There have been some prosecutions on that. No one knows if it is a gateway to further abuse or if it is something that acts as a proxy so that people won't defend further. But that's not something we can really ethically test. And I do side on, on I do sort of err on the side of caution there and think that it's particularly in that aspect where there are minors involved that is something or representation of minors involved that's something that we should regulate quite closely mm -hmm. um, otherwise if it is um, adults in what would mirror a consensual adult relationship I don't see the problem quite so much but there are possible applications yes uh, I mean at the moment is very one-sided as you say it's very much um, a, it's a very niche um, market so it's just a handful of workshops worldwide who are creating mechanized versions of sex dolls with some AI in them um, for people who would be most inclined usually to, to buy sex dolls already so it's a really really limited market and it's very much geared towards men towards heterosexual men um, but then robotics in general reflects that too. So we know that Silicon Valley has a huge problem with diversity in, in diversity of sex, diversity in race, diversity in class. And so it's just a microcosm of that yet again. Mm -hmm. And how, what, what do you think we should do to, to change that? To, uh... oh, I wish I had a solution. I wish I had a solution. I've been, you know, I go to so many um, things that are around women, you know, how do we get more women in tech? How do we solve the pipeline problem? And we all know there's a problem and we know some, we know where it happens. We know that by around the age of 10 or 11, girls are feeling that they aren't suited to a life of tech. They're told that they are in some way inferior. They're told that it's not their space. Yeah. And even when they persist and go through to university, then we see another drop. Um, in numbers and then once you know if, if they want to go into research again we just watch women leave uh, again and again and again for many different reasons so it's hard to say I think a two-pronged approach we need to be going in early sort of grassroots level we need to be educating and showing that this path is possible and to do that at the same time we need to have more visible women um, fronting the mm -hmm. robotics work and the AI work that's being done we need to see people out there doing the work, women out there that we can emulate. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with you um, because I, I lead actually, it happens that I lead one of the NGOs called Girls in Tech and we, we see the same problems. Um, and also like many of our uh, women who are our members either leave the um, industry because they don't have any role models, they don't have any support, support ne network, so they are trying to find one like within organizations like ours. Uh, but yes, like having role models is, is crucial. I think so. I think one of the issues is it's just so systemic that the whole tech industry, all of Silicon Valley, is built around this tech bro culture that emerged in the 1980s and we've not escaped that even though we're aware of it we can't seem to get away from it and i think there has to be really systemic change in order to move things forward yeah yeah and bringing more women is actually good for for your profit right so um that's that's the other thing i don't understand i never could understand why tech companies are so willing to ignore 51 percent of the population because as a marketing ploy it's terrible right you, you want more people using your product include women mm -hmm. correct I completely agree. Um, so another area, uh, which actually we already uh, kind of started uh, discussing, um, which you are very vocal, is gender equality, um, uh, also in the sphere of AI. And what do you think needs to be done? You mentioned we need to like regulate this, but how do you think we should start designing systems uh, to prevent bias and discrimination? Oh, again, I wish I had an easy answer to this one. There are so many people working on this. Um, I think we've there. There's a 
the Silicon Valley idea of moving fast and breaking things mm -hmm. doesn't work, right? It gets products made, but it doesn't get good products made because down the line, we find more and more problems emerging and bias is a huge one of those. And it's not just what's emerging from the tech that's problematic. The bias is creeping in at every stage, at every level. Data sets are not objective. Mm -hmm. And the, the environment in which the tech is built is not objective. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's always, the tech is political, there is always something going on that skews it in some way. So I think that we really need to examine the environment in which things are being built. Before we even get to what the data is, we need to look at what's going on. And if you think about where's the money coming from, right? So there've been several high profile funding scandals in the past few years about dubious sources of money or the, the, the kind of people who are leading organizations and what else they've been up to. So we have got to say, you know, is, is that, who is benefiting from this? Who's being left out of this? What is the environment like? And I think until we actually step back and examine the environment in which things are being created, mm -hmm. we can't really affect any change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Either you have to track the money, <laughs> but <laughs> the easiest... Follow the money. Follow the money. Where is the, where is, where is the source? And... But also, like the the part of it is is data transparency, right? So uh, we should be able to explain how we achieve that like um, outcome, like where did it come from, where was yeah. it? Yeah. I mean, and, and that's not an easy thing to do. And especially when you get into deep learning, where there are so many layers there that we, we can't possibly track what's happening inside the black box. But what we can do is at least audit along the way to show how this was set up or where the information is coming from and then what comes out the other end and what happens if you tweak some variables what happens when you explore the data further and i think that this is something that um people have been doing in other areas of research for for quite some time anything where there is a black box type environment people have been studying this psychology is a great example um so we've got to look at ways that we can apply that to ai mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the other area which is closely related is uh, the ethical um, ethical AI. We already like discussed a little bit on the governance and, and regulation, right? Like, but like considering there are so many different, obviously countries, nationalities, um, cultures, how do we, how do you think we should build those systems to prevent from abusing like countries or companies abusing power <laughs> i know you will say i don't you don't have any <laughs> I, do have some, I have some ideas i have i, I have some ideas okay, so <laughs> so it's it's immediately so difficult because of this jurisdiction issue mm -hmm. Um, and I think that there is a there is a case to be made for governance on a country level mm -hmm. um, but then how much do you trust the government <laughs> um, <laughs> Mine, mm. I'm watching what's going on with uh, test and trace things here for COVID and I'm thinking, I'm not sure I want you to be involved in tech development. Um, and you, know, you can see this emerging around the world. So I think there is, an issue, there is a case to be made for governments to regulate within the country, but then when you have corporations that cross many countries mm -hmm. um, who are themselves the size of a country, mm -hmm. um, what do we require them to do? And if I was doing any kind of development at my university, I would have to go through an ethics board. I would have to apply for ethical clearance to be able to develop the, the tech I develop. Whereas we're seeing industries who have no accountability mm -hmm. and are not willing to make that accountability if there is any transparency. So we still don't know who sits on the Google ethics board, for example, mm -hmm. that DeepMind re requested to be set up. We don't know how Facebook is monitoring or if it's monitoring what goes on there. So. I would call for corporate accountability. I think that's a, a really big thing. Um, and there are different ways of implementing that. One way is through fines. If they don't, if they don't um, adhere to regulation, then we hit them in the pocket so that they, they are gonna lose money. Um, but I think a really good way that we've seen working is through the power of those who are either working there or who are consuming the product. Mm -hmm. And when we see things like Google cancelling um, projects because their staff are walking out, I think that's a really powerful message. Mm -hmm. Or making their um, tech advisory board collapse after a week because they weren't happy with the way it was set up. And I think that you know there, there's a fine line though between calling people out and shutting them down. But I think that it's, it's pretty good when you get that 
kickback from society that says, okay, we had enough of this. We want to see that you're doing the right thing with our data because it is the data that belongs to, there'd be nothing without user data there. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that. I think that one of the other things that, that gets suggested is that we have some kind of UN level governance on AI. And that does work for some things. Like we're trying to get that in for autonomous weapon systems, mm -hmm. for example. And I think that's something that is really important. Um, would it work on a practical level for all aspects of AI? Probably not, mm -hmm. um, but it can at least give us guiding principles in the same way that we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, for example. There are guiding principles with which we should steer development. So lots of different suggestions. I mean, there's been such an explosion in AI ethics since about 2017, when suddenly everyone was really getting on board. Um, and some of it less genuine in its motivation than others because I think there are a lot of companies out there who want to be seen to be doing the right thing so mm -hmm. we get to the problem of ethics washing yeah. and it's it's very it's one thing to say hey we know there's a problem we know it should be ethical it's another to actually implement it and we're starting to see that now in the past year there have been a lot of there's been a lot of movement towards how do we actually build this into systems how do we actually create accountability in systems and in the development environment so I'm vaguely optimistic that we will emerge with something um, that some kind of consensus whether that is regulations whether that is self auditing whether that is external auditors coming in and saying okay if you want to be seem like a credible company we will audit your AI and see how well you're doing mm -hmm. so there are lots of options and and I guess it's just a battle to see which one works best of all exactly it's, it's so difficult because uh, you mentioned uh, auditing um, there are so many frauds uh, with like auditing firms which have been there for for like uh, banks for example for ages so obviously they will be auditing the way the banks want them um, yeah yeah <laughs> so it, it's yeah it's such a, a new and a weird way of working i think the scale of it makes it so so difficult mm -hmm. and yet it has to be done and we see really bad examples of bad technology emerging all the time and pro really problematic stuff and mm -hmm. you know we're looking more and more at just how harmful some of this stuff can be so mm -hmm. there have to be some decisions taken about what the limits are mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah like you said the <laughs> facebook uh, actually just it seems like n nothing happened with the cambridge yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so as you as we just said the the ai tech is um it's like a double-edged sword um and Obviously, it's so difficult. It's a question, obviously, of ethics, of philosophical questions, of how how much good it uh, it gives to the society versus how bad it can uh, be, uh, because there are some companies which are m monitoring performance of the employees, for example, and they uh, take screenshots every day, like kind of Big Brother thing. Uh, but it also, in a way, it's um, contributing to analyzing the performance and maybe the the intention of the employee uh, employers is actually to help those employees um, to be better maybe to notice uh, something which the employee wouldn't be able to or wouldn't want to say in in like face to face right so how how can we use it <laughs> how can we balance the the double-edged sword. <laughs> so I think you're being very generous suggesting that the companies are doing this for the good of the employee. <laughs> I'm not convinced and I'm a strong advocate for privacy and I do think that a lot of that technology is far too invasive, absolutely. And also, you know, it's, it's, it's detrimental in the end because it, it doesn't engender trust between an employer and an employee. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we need to rethink the way we are doing things and we need to be designing systems with people at the heart of them. Mm -hmm. And we've seen this move in software engineering over the years where it moved from here is an engineering solution right through to here is a user experience that we want to create. And I think AI needs to do that. We need, we need design led AI that can say there are people at the core of this. There are people, there's people's data driving mm -hmm. it, but there are people using it as mm -hmm. well. And we need to factor that in as a central component, not as some additional thing just to yeah. make the technology work. And, and we need to have a serious look at the kind of things we are doing to people in the system. And 
we have we have to think about who's creating that technology right now. It's incredibly technocratic. It's coming out of Silicon Valley, um, primarily. And there's a vast swathes of the world that are not being included. The global south um, with emerging AI is just getting ignored. So how are we distributing the AI to other places in the world mm -hmm. where there are people who could do amazing things with it? Because I do think that AI has the power to do a lot of good. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, people will always say, oh, tech for good, that's, you know, that's a great thing. What a great idea, very utopian vision. But there are, we're seeing beneficial tech coming out. So how do we make sure that's in the hands of people who can use that and, and who could be able to develop that for really beneficial purposes? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I'd like to see. So maybe, maybe we just need a revolution. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like you, like you said, it's it's all about um, getting the consent from from the person that their data is being used. Because in a way, like you want to have good, like relevant to you uh, information on adverts because it may be useful for you, right? But you want to make sure that you know what you are giving away. Yeah, and we want it to be representative. So, um, for example, Fitbit have done medical papers and medical discoveries out of all the Fitbit data that users have contributed through mm -hmm. using their product. But at the same time, that data is coming from a very select group who can afford to own and wear and participate in exercise with a Fitbit. Mm -hmm. So it's not reflective of all the people out there who can't afford to own that technology. It's it, And it, it becomes a, a perpetuating, sort of self-perpetuating cycle where the data that we are getting comes from people who can afford the technology and it's a very select class uh, and we are excluding people further who can't participate in that and the people who don't own the technology we may find their data is coming in through other routes it's coming in through monitoring by police it's coming in through government tracking mm -hmm. that's not fair that's not good representation um, right across the different aspects of technology mm -hmm. difficult topics to tackle <laughs> yeah <laughs> so let's go back to the topic of emotional AI. Uh, so there are many companies and scientists uh, which, which try to create AI which can detect and react to human emotions, um, hoping to humanize the technology and improve the ways we connect with each other. Why do you think it's especially important right now to, to look at it? There's lots going on around this because a lot of the voice assistants, especially mm -hmm. um, companies want to give them a sense of personality mm -hmm. and sort of differentiate them from one another. Um, of course, they've chosen initially to make all voice assistants female, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> is really annoying and putting women in a, a, a role of servitude there. But I think that there is something very compelling about creating that anthropomorphic bond with the technology. So making you feel as if you have the same social experience as you do with another person, um, especially in conversational AI. So if you can create that, that's going to sell more of your product or that's going to give a better user experience. Mm -hmm. um, if it, if it works, if it glitches, it's really noticeable. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't take very much for it to work. Um, mm -hmm. So if we look at examples like Eliza, which wasn't, there was no AI involved there, it was just a script. That's a chatbot that just threw people's questions back at them, but they felt immediately included and they felt that they could talk, talk um, to this computer. And that is something that, we do, and there's been lots of research on that. So um, Clifford Nass's paper of, of Computers as Social Actors explores how even with the, the most minimal of technology, we form a social bond because we are social beings. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's a very compelling goal to be able to engineer emotional AI. And I find it interesting. I don't find it inherently bad. I, mm -hmm. I think it could be really useful. Yeah. Um, it's always nice to have that feeling that you you're being listened to that you have mm -hmm. companionship it's why people put on the radio or the television when they're at home alone so they can have other human voices around so this is a, an instinct that doesn't it doesn't frighten me that people might want to do that at all um, but yeah can we do it in a in a nice way <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds really strange but can we can we do it where it's not just picking up the same tired old tropes that we've had up until now like with the uh the the kind of servant voiced woman voice assistant or uh, you know something a flirty woman voice or things like that can we do it in an interesting way with mm -hmm. some kind of equality and diversity and parity 
Mm -hmm. And as you, as you know, like many of the societies are the aging uh, societies, like in Japan, for example. So this could be very well used uh, to serve or like to help uh, elderly um, who don't have anyone, right? So to, to make them. Yes. Yes. And there's been quite a lot of kickback from from younger people saying we don't want to do that and by younger I mean sort of anyone I don't know <laughs> my age I like to call myself young here <laughs> but younger as well saying you know why should my parents or my grandparents have to have a, a, a an AI or a robot to talk to you know they should have human contact well yeah they should but there isn't enough um but actually I I, I talked to so my, my grandmother who lived alone up until her death and uh, uh, when she was 91 um she was so keen to live alone and she wasn't really capable of it because she um, had mobility difficulties, um, she had vascular dementia. If she had had some kind of um, care robot, if she had some kind of AI that could remind her to take her medication, that could remind her to eat, that would have been so useful. Mm -hmm. She wanted more than anything to stay in her own home and not have to go into a care home. Mm -hmm. And you see lots of interesting reports, anecdotal reports from um, elderly people who have said, um, I like having Alexa, someone to talk to, or, you know, I've, I, I love trying out virtual reality so I can feel like I'm in a different place and there's some really lovely stories around that um, and there have been some studies on it about you know, sort of therapy bots or things like Paro the seal mm -hmm. um, the little robotic seal that people find really cute and it feels like a, a companion of sorts so I think um, I think we have a tendency as we when we are younger to really infantilize older people to take away a lot of their agency and say oh we know what's best for them and not actually listen to the voices of them who are going actually this is quite good <laughs> um so i think it's it really is good if we listen to what people say they want and you know when i teach i, I teach um human computer interaction to mm -hmm. students and um every year without fail someone will say we're making our technology they have to design a prototype and they'll say we're making our prototype for um for elderly users aged 50 and over and i'm like what oh, no. <laughs> I'm, 50 and over. I'm 44 and i can understand this technology i help build it and you know i think they they have this idea that anyone over the age of like 30 can't use technology and um i have we have to keep saying you know the, the generation now that that are retiring are the people who build these systems you you can't just assume that old people can't use tech that just doesn't happen anymore so i think yeah there is there is a scope for really interesting things to happen in that landscape for elderly people mm -hmm. um, and we shouldn't just presume to know exactly what it is that they want yeah and especially that our life ex like is extended much more yeah <laughs> the, yeah absolutely the new 30 <laughs> <laughs> um okay so let's talk about the potential impact on jobs which is actually already um present uh it's said that those repetitive low skilled jobs um are, are going to vanish due to automation and ai but the jobs that seem safe are the more human-oriented jobs, uh, the ones that involve emotional intelligence. Uh, so how do you think the world will look like when AI catches up and we will, what kind of jobs will we be <laughs> doing, if, if any? So it's interesting this because while there's been automation and the initial I mean, the, we're what, the fourth industrial revolution. The, the, these industrial revolutions are always about how can we take away um, repetitive labor from humans and make things more efficient. And, you know, we got to do that with a lot of low paid jobs or dangerous jobs mm -hmm. or jobs that no one wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, but now, now that AI is coming after the, the middle class jobs, you know, the, the sort of the white collar jobs, everyone's getting really restless going, oh, I didn't mean they could take my job. Yeah. Uh, and, but I think there's, there's a few ways of looking at it. So one is that, you, as you say, there's a lot of work around um, those jobs that require emotion or, or uh, affective responses. Mm -hmm. um, and effective labor is one of our, is, is a major part of our, our industries today. So people on customer service or people mm -hmm. serving, all of those things. And that's not a particularly wonderful job to be doing when you're in a bad mood for example you don't want to put up with someone you know why can't you stick a bot in and that's what's happening on websites and things like that you know and you're getting you're getting that bit is actually 
I think taking away a job that, that it's quite difficult to do. There are jobs that we won't replace easily and care is a big one. So we talked about old age. Um, the physical act of caring, of looking after elderly people or ill people, that's not going away anytime soon because we simply don't have robotics that can do that. Mm -hmm. um, the, the way we go in with tech, it's far more likely we'll have assistive technologies to help us. Mm -hmm. um, so Japan has swapped its robot strategy from being robots that will do the heavy lifting to exoskeletons for carers who will do the lifting. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also the jobs that spring up because of AI. So there's a huge amount of what's been termed ghost labor. So people who are filling the gaps where AI can't quite meet um, efficiency. Uh, so this is why a lot of work is outsourced to people like, there, there, there are um, a bunch of people on the other side of the world in slums in Kenya who are labeling uh, images for self-driving cars, right? So it's been outsourced and they're, they're an invisible workforce. And the, the report, I think it was a report last year that came out to show that far more companies that say they use AI are actually using people and pretending they're AI than, than are. I mean, like even Amazon's mechanical mm -hmm. turn, right? Yeah, so there's, there's so much going on there. And then even if we get to the stage where those jobs can be replaced by AI, we still get the jobs that go along with that. So verification, we still get jobs in maintenance, we still got jobs in, in designing other experiences. And you know, this the quote that often I hear is, you know, we didn't have web designers before we had the internet, for example. Mm -hmm. So there will be jobs that spring up. Um, so it's not to say that I don't think there will be job losses, there definitely will. Um, and not everyone's job is safe, but we see um, we see other it's 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 much more complex than just saying. Um, these jobs will go, these people will be unemployed because I think we see these other economies emerging as well. Um, will we one day live in a sort of fully automated luxury communism style universal basic income society? Well, you know, it'd be nice if we were in some kind of post-scarcity landscape, but right now we're nowhere near that. <laughs> oh, you just, you just <laughs> mentioned my next question, but yeah, you're, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The company we were mentioning, uh, which um, gives actually work to the people in Africa, was it Somersource, maybe? That I can't remember. There's, been, there's, there's quite a few that do. It's an interesting one because um, some of them are saying, they, they, some companies like to spin it as in, we are really ramping up employment in a mm -hmm. really deprived area. Mm -hmm. But then they're also going, but we don't pay them anywhere near what we pay the people in the US because we don't want to disrupt the local economy. And you're thinking, mm, this, is not, <laughs> this is not great. So, you know, there's, there's upskilling, but then there's also the, just how much of this is your guilt that you're trying to switch to. Mm -hmm. So it's really tricky. It's an, uh, it's an interesting balance, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, it's in, but it's really amazing that there are companies which are for profit, but with social um, responsibility goal, let's say. Uh, I, I, yeah, um, the cynical part of me thinks how much of this is social responsibility because mm -hmm. they can get some very cheap outsourcing. Mm -hmm. But I do, I'm, I welcome the idea that companies are looking to do socially beneficial things. I think if, if they are set up with that aim, you know, I'm not going to just straight away accuse them of, <laughs> of not doing that. You know, hopefully that will motivate people to do things. And I think that's better than nothing for sure. Yeah, and, and if they are paying much more than what's the local... Uh, yeah. Even better. Um, okay, <laughs> so expanding on that, um, if uh, most of our jobs are automated and we can choose uh, to work or not to work, how do you think it will impact people's satisfaction and happiness? Uh, if we assume that a job or like the <laughs> vocation is a road to happiness, um, do you think people will have trouble in finding purpose and meaning? Oh, deep. <laughs> no, that's a really good question. Um, I guess it depends on the job that you do. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I was told tomorrow that my job was over, there are aspects of it that I really would not miss, right? I, I, I just don't want to do any more admin. <laughs> The admin part is just so, but you know, I would really miss research. I would really miss writing. Um, I would really miss teaching because I enjoy teaching. Um, but, you know, so I think I would still keep on doing it. I would still keep on doing the bits I like. Um, and some people are really lucky and they have that in their work. And it might be something they keep on doing just because they enjoy it. Uh, for others, it could be a, a wonderful opportunity 
to find something that they really enjoy mm -hmm. instead of being trapped in a, in a job they find difficult or dull or that just isn't giving them any kind of work-life balance um wouldn't it be really really nice if we had that and then suddenly other things were valued like childcare, like mm -hmm. labor in the home i think that would be amazing where the the non um non-labor aspects the non-traditional labor aspects are valued more and we start to see work done uh we start to see the same consideration given to work um in the home all that kind of ghost labor all that kind of effective mm -hmm. labor that's being done day after day um mm -hmm. in the home yeah amazing but some of the um some of this like especially the child um uh support is seen right now when when we like <laughs> are facing the COVID situation oh yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah there are so many things which changed and and how people perceive work what do they value right now and uh, what do they want they they won't miss <laughs> like to yeah and i think it's it's been fascinating and i wish i had time to study it but actually i am doing childcare oh. alongside trying to move on <laughs> university courses online and all this other stuff so i'm not getting to to do that but it's a fascinating glimpse of society and what is valued and there's so much research coming out that women are not getting to do as much research for example as men because of the lot of the default tasks in the home are falling to them as always on top mm -hmm. of school and everything else so uh, will that change how we view things mm -hmm. uh, probably not but it's good that it's been flagged up mm -hmm. okay <laughs> thank you and the the thing you already mentioned the universal uh, basic income and um, in theory it's supposed to be a mechanism to make sure that everyone will enjoy the the fruits of the progress how do you think if uh, that will ever happen how do you think it will affect you know how societies work and obviously there are some um studies already being made i think it was in um somewhere in Nord nordic countries yeah. where they were trying to do this yeah i i, I kind of like the idea um i think it's definitely worth trying i mean you know if we were in a position where we were able to do that um I don't see what the downsides would be if if the work was being done, if things were not, if there was not a scarcity. And again, I think the people who want to, who find meaning in their work, will still be able to carry out a lot of that work. It's not stopping anyone from going to do that, but it provides a, a better standard of living for everyone. Then I would welcome it. I'm not an economist, so I don't know <laughs> all the ramifications of it. But I mean, in theory, I'm, I have no objection to it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> so let's, let's wait. <laughs> let's just wait. <laughs> um, <laughs> And do you see, uh, like right now, um, any autonomous um, like examples of like the technology and how uh, it affects the, the the way we work, the way we enjoy lives? <laughs> um, I think just the, the the wonderful way in which a lot of AI has gone seamlessly into our lives that make things easier. Mm -hmm. um, for example, maps are an amazing thing i don't have to remember how to get places anymore i can offload that cognition onto my smartphone mm -hmm. which will give me directions and and correct me if i'm going the wrong way um i still love maps i still <laughs> i still love to look physically at maps but you know i don't have to have that uh cognitive processing to be able to find directions and i know that some people that scares them the thought that we are losing knowledge i don't think we are losing knowledge because other knowledge comes in to fill that gap so we are we have the whole world at our fingertips on a phone now you know we can look up anything we want to and that's incredible so just because i don't remember someone's phone number because it's programmed in the phone why you know why is that a problem you know um i don't see it as a problem as, we, long, as long as we have the battery <laughs> yeah well this is the thing it's really interesting how quickly people are affected by that and how quickly their mood changes and i don't myself the, the anger and frustration you feel if you can't get a signal you don't know where you're going or you get cut out when you're trying to remember someone's phone number so yeah there, you know that is that is tricky but you know i think that we we adapt we always adapt. We're humans. We're very, very good at adapting to new things. And we are very good at coming up with interesting technologies and adapting to them, even when we fear them initially. Mm -hmm. So all of the things that we worry about around technology, we're going to adapt to them. Some will succeed, some won't. And the ones that do will be the ones that 
we find successful and useful. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's a really good thing. We're moving forward. We're always moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the market verifies it, as you, as you said. Yeah. Okay, uh, you, uh, you've been great. <laughs> you've <laughs> finished almost all questions by, but one. So to finish, uh, where do you think the whole AI is heading? Ah, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm normally, I'm quite an optimist around technology. Uh -huh. um, but with AI currently, I think we're due another AI winter. So I think things are starting to, the hype is starting to fade. Mm -hmm. We're starting to see a leveling off. I would not be surprised if it stalls for a bit, um, especially not just in terms of the technology. So, you know, are we seeing that deep learning is going as far as it can go right now? Maybe, but not just that, but in terms of, are we now seeing the repercussions from a lot of the things we've created? Yes, we are. And perhaps it's time that we did pause and perhaps an AI winter is going to be a beneficial thing because it allows us to stop and take stock of what we've done and say, okay, this is problematic. This has to change in the next iteration. We can't go forward like this. So if I, I think that AI is due a bit of a pause, that's not necessarily a negative thing because it allows us to reevaluate. Mm -hmm. um, things I'm not scared of, I'm not scared that the singularity is gonna happen anytime soon. <laughs> um, I, I, I think that's a long way off if it ever happens. Um, I find it interesting, the developments that are occurring. So GPT-3 was really interesting to watch. Um, I think it's like one of the, I, I'm, I'm, uh, when I'm on social media, I'm, I'm, I never fight with anyone on social media. That's my rule, never fight with anyone. But my God, the hostility I got for suggesting that GPT-3 might not be the best thing in the world. And I had all these guys coming at me going, no, you're so wrong. You're just, you, you know, you don't deserve to live. It's always kind of oh, really, wow. I know it's, it's, it, it kind of get a grip. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think, um, critiquing tech doesn't always go down well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's time that we had a slowing down. Um, we've seen several AI winters before and we've mm -hmm. emerged from them. So maybe maybe there's another one on the cards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, it's like the market, the governments and the society, um, like us humans need to realize where are we heading and then rethink our priorities. Um, Okay, so where do you, that's another question I should have finished by then, but where do, what do you think is going to be right now the focus, if not AI? Oh, that's a really good question. I guess it's going to be health right now, given the, the state of things at the moment with the pandemic. So we're going to see a lot more around that. I mean, that seems to be like a major priority for all research right now. So every funding body I know of, all the universities I know of, they're prioritizing healthcare mm -hmm. and they're prioritizing advancements in that, whether it's advancements in data science, um, which may or may not, you know, it, it may be something that feeds into AI, but it could just be number crunching. Um, it, it could be in um, epidemiology, it could be in vaccine development, but I think we're going to see a lot more poured into that to try and, and halt pandemics um, because this is clearly, this was unexpected. It's not likely it's going to be the only one. We've got to start rethinking things in terms of that. So um, technology may or may not be the thing that, that solves that. I'm not convinced it does have the answers. I think there's so much more there to be seen, um, including a lot of work on so society and behavior and, and all sorts of things. Um, so perhaps that's the next area of research. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, technology will like, is always going to augment what we are yeah. as humans <laughs> trying to do. Okay, uh, we are done with questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your, for your time. Thank and, you. <laughs> and we will be publishing this on Thursday, next Thursday. Okay, great. Thanks very much. I really enjoyed that. It was lovely talking to you. <laughs> lovely. Thanks. Bye. 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 <laughs>